Oh, dear me, that was a lovely vacation. Hammerfell is wonderful this time of year. I just wish Nerevar didn't get eaten by mud crabs. I guess I'll see him again in the next incarnation. Ha ha ha. But it is nice to be back in Morrow. I mean on Mars, where I can talk about nerdy stuff again. So let us begin. There are principally three sources of oxygen on Mars. The most obvious one is oxygenic photosynthesis, performed by fractarians, some spongisporians, and various microorganisms. This source is limited, as the high aridity on Mars prevents the growth of much vegetation. And during the exceedingly long winters, some of the flora enters long phases of dormancy in which photosynthesis may be completely halted. The second source is photolysis. The lack of a strong magnetosphere allows the solar rays to more easily penetrate the thin Martian air, in the process breaking up the molecules inside water vapor into oxygen and hydrogen. In the past, this process may have significantly contributed to the oxygenation, but the loss of much atmospheric mass and the extreme aridity of the planet have consequently made this a minor factor. The third source is found in an unlikely location, in some regions on Mars, both in the southern and northern hemisphere, a special type of salt flat desert has formed. Under intense UV radiation, sodium chlorides left behind by an ocean that has long since evaporated, react with silicate minerals in the soil and form vast plains of perchlorate salts. Perchlorates occur naturally on Earth only in places like the Atacama Desert or Death Valley and are otherwise mainly produced and used in rocket and pyrotechnics industries. They are highly toxic to almost all life as we know it and cause thyroid and lung damage as well as anemia in humans. The perchlorate deserts of Mars are possibly the most deadly places on a planet that is already pretty dead. This is despite the deserts close to the polar regions also happening to be some of the wetter parts of the Martian surface, as perchlorate acts as an excellent antifreeze. Small streams and pools, sometimes even oases of brine lakes, are sprinkled throughout these deserts, but they are so toxic that no life form can survive in them. Almost no life form. On Mars, as on Earth, extremophile microorganisms exist, which can actually metabolize perchlorate salts. These so-called halophilic perch lorianta, which may dwell in almost every one of these brines, can reduce perchlorate back into harmless chloride. The amazing thing about this reaction is that it generates free oxygen as a waste product. The oases inside the perchlorate deserts, as lifeless as they may seem, are downright infused with these thriving organisms and are thus one of the major oxygen providers of the Martian surface. And the best thing about them is that they operate almost year-round. The Horus operations have been quick to understand the potential of these deserts. While the perchlorates have been used for a quite a while already as oxidizers for rocket fuels, recent experiments have begun constructing biovats in which these organisms are raised and fed in order to more easily generate oxygen for their own habitats. These salty wastelands are also not completely devoid of macroscopic life. As the process by which the perchlorient microbes create oxygen also turns toxic perchlorate back into regular sodium chloride, the brine oases may be extremely salty, but they are far less toxic than the perchlorate flats that surround them. A few halophilic extremophiles can thus carve out a life inside the brine ponds. They largely consist of simple plant life, various worms, and some antitremitans and pseudoticulates, the majority of which are barely visible with the naked eye. These salt dwarves may tremble when the shadow of a caraxor glides over their home. It is the only large animal thriving in this desolation. The caraxor is a periostracon distantly related to the Nothornithes. Whereas Nothornitha are bird-like bipeds, the ancestors of the caraxor and its relatives, also known as the pedicambulata, have gone down a different route. In the ancestral periostracons, the tail was exoskeletal, constructed of hardened tunicine rings, making it similar to the chitinous tails of crustaceans. In some of their descendants, many of these rings seem to have fused with each other into elongated solid elements until they formed a third appendage comparable to the hind legs of some insects. The evolution of a third leg has given the older limbs of these tripods more freedom than in the Benus, allowing them to adapt to more specialized uses. Evidently, some took to flying. With its bat-like wings, the caraxor soars through the deserts in search of brine pools. 
In these, the aerial tripod wades and feeds much like an Andean flamingo. Pedicambulates have a much higher tendency towards polydonty than their nothornithe cousins, meaning that their scolecophores can bear multiple tooth shafts. The four scolecophores of its jaw thus bear multiple shafts, forming comb-like tight slits. With this derived jaw apparatus, it sifts the brine for small organisms of which it is the only predator. Strong glands underneath the armpits help with excreting much of the salt, allowing it also to drink the brine. During flight and feeding, a dense pelt of white fur protects it from the harsh solar rays and the cold desert nights. Possibly the Caraxor also has some form of tolerance to the toxic effect of perchlorates, perhaps through endosymbiosis with the same organisms that make the desert livable. Caraxors do not sleep or nest beside the brine pools in which they feed. Instead, they fly out towards rocky outcrops in the middle of the perchlorate wastes where they can rest and hatch their eggs in safety above the toxic ground. The many remains of dead animals along the desert outskirts attest to the success of this strategy. Any would-be predator venturing here to feed on the carex or, or its eggs is likely to die beforehand from the aridity and especially the toxicity. Thus, the carex rule alone over the white wastes, their only company being the dry, bleached bones of fools. But to be a king in the desolation is still better than to be a pawn in death. It is a largely peaceful life, with their only enemies being disease or themselves. I hope you enjoyed this video and look forward to the coming ones. Make sure to like and subscribe, visit the project's original website, and maybe also check out my Patreon, Yunwa. There you may get to view the next videos early.